Dr. Lison, thank you so much for coming onto the podcast. I'm so honored and thrilled to have you here. Um, I, I know you're a very busy person, so I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for coming onto the podcast. No, thank you so much for asking me. Seriously, it's a pleasure. Um, so, for people who don't know who you are, you you know I follow you on social, so I suspect many many people um, follow you on social too. But for those who don't know who you are, would you be kind enough just to, to um, say a few words about what you do? Sure, absolutely. I am a professor of medicine as well as professor of surgery at Brown University here in Providence, Rhode Island, in the United States. My clinical focus has, is people with um, pelvic cancers. Uh, which um, are cancers of the overuterus cervix mostly, but I also treat uh, people with breast cancer and soft tissue sarcoma. I have a special interest in uh, the life after cancer arena, otherwise known as survivorship, as it specifically relates to sexuality. And I wow. am um, a strong believer in the good that can come out of social media. So I am present in multiple platforms, including Twitter and TikTok. Fantastic. Yeah. For, for anybody who doesn't follow Dr. Dylan, we'll leave his um, link at the end of this podcast because you definitely need to follow him because he's awesome on, on all the socials. Um, so I'm, I'm, yeah, I, I'm thrilled that you're kind of into the survivorship aspect of um, cancer um, because I, I am also uh, an absolute believer in the importance of that. You know, as you know, more uh, people are surviving cancer um, and, you know, we as physicians, we um, kind of, you know, obviously it's important to be able to treat the cancer, but at the same time, we don't want to forget what happens following the end of um, tr uh, the cancer treatment. So and we can definitely talk about that um, also as um, in this podcast, but I think I, I, you know, amazingly, you're the first oncologist to come onto this podcast, which is um, amazing. Um, and I thought, theref <laughs> yeah, you're the first. Um, and I, I, you know, I thought, okay, which who who's the best oncologist to get on um, as the first oncologist? So you, you're the chosen one, I'm afraid. Um, but I, I wanted to talk about chemotherapy because you know, chemotherapy is a treatment that many many patients um, will need. Um, but of course, it's also the treatment that many people um, are apprehensive about and fearful. So um, I guess at the basic level, what is chemotherapy and, and how does it work? Yeah, chemotherapy, you know, when I trained, was the only way you could treat cancers, including breast cancer. And um, I think people who um, have a vision of what people with cancer look like it stems from those historical days where treatment was quite brutal. Um, people lost their hair, lost their appetite, lost weight, um, and looked sick. So even today, people who come in to see me and are aware that chemotherapy is on the table, they have that picture and that deathly fear that that's going to be them. Ke uh, chemotherapy as the oldest treatments for cancer, really, um, do not have a specific target. So even though it's meant to kill cancer cells, chemotherapy targets rapidly dividing cells. And, and, it's, and it's a very non-specific way, which explains the side effects. So there can be, with some chemotherapy, it can um, destroy the nerve cells and people can get numbness and tingling in their hands and feet. With some drugs, it's reversible, meaning that the nerves will regenerate with time, but for other drugs, it's permanent. It can explain the hair loss with some drugs, um, and it can explain the risks of fever and lowering of the white counts as it attacks your body's own defenses. So it's, it's essentially, it's like a bomb going off in the body, and you hope that bomb will kill all of the cancer cells, but that sort of bystander effect where normal cells are also impacted is unfortunately the, the aspect of what makes chemotherapy both toxic, but also for, for people hearing it for the first time, exceptionally scary. Yeah, no, that's, that's absolutely true. And I think, I guess there is that unpredictability of how chemo will affect um, people, right? So Yes. You know, for some people are actually, you know, that they're affected to a degree, but not too bad. 
but there mm-hmm. are others who are completely incapacitated. Some, you know, even uh, they have to be admitted to hospital because of sepsis and things. So, um, is there a way to gauge that, or is it just depends on how your body will react to it? Then, you know, something that you can't really judge. Well, you know, we have textbooks that tell us um, what the major side effects are of the uh, of the common drugs used, let's say, to treat breast cancer, mm-hmm. and you know, we know what our um, what people can expect. So everyone who starts on an, uh, a program of chemotherapy, I tell them about the drugs and the side effects, the, poten- the, the risks as well as the potential benefits of treatment of why I am asking them to go through this. But in the same time, they also meet with nursing staff and social work and, you know, they get as comprehensive of an education as we can provide when it comes to chemotherapy, how it's administered, the side effects. Yeah. At our institution, we even have a, a, a 24-hour call back to see how people are doing after treatments. But every once in a while, you you uh, you um, take care of people right. who apparently did not read the textbook right. and are coming sure. in with side effects that are very individual, that are out of expectations of what you thought you would see. And it might be, you know, heart failure in someone after two doses of a drug called adriamycin, commonly referred to as the red devil, or um, a a, a horrific neuropathy that's going on, coming on very quickly after administration of paclitaxel. These are things we should be able to predict. And in the vast majority, it's, it is predictable, the side effects, but not everybody reacts that way. Some will, like you said, Tasha, go through treatment and it'll be easy. Others, it will be a struggle to get Mm. them through each cycle. Yeah. And I, you know, when I mentioned to them that it, chemotherapy is likely to be on the cards. That's the question that they ask me. Um, and obviously, you know, you, you tell them that, yes, unfortunately, you will unfortunately get chemotherapy side effects because, as you said, they're predictable. I guess the degree of, you know, how much you're affected by the chemotherapy, that's yeah. perhaps slightly unpredictable. Yeah. You know, yeah. what's so interesting about that is, you know, coming into even modern day today, mm. the way we talk about treatments and their side effects is that we talk to each other around um, toxicity profiles. You know, these are the serious toxicities associated with the drug. These are the not so serious toxicities. But what I'm hearing, you know, from patient advocates across the globe, really, is that it's not about toxicity. It's about tolerability. Mm. How tolerable is this treatment? You might think you're putting me in this drug and it has a 90% chance of grade one diarrhea, but it won't land you in the hospital that will happen five percent. But if I'm a young mother and I have to stand and wait for my children to get out of school and you're asking me to wear a diaper because mm. of that grade one diarrhea, that's not tolerable. Yeah. You know, so I think you know, uh we, uh the the scientific community need a way to communicate tolerability. I'm not sure talking about toxicity is sufficient these days. Yeah, that's a really interesting thing. I never really thought about it from that angle. Yeah, because, you know what I mean? That's, it's what yeah. you learn if you listen to these conversations on social media, which I am so interested in our, our, our colleague going on. But it's actually something that I picked up on conversations that people were very public about having. It's like, you know, grade one toxicities mean nothing. Mm, Tell absolutely. Me it's tolerable. That's, you know? a, that's a really good way to put it. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna take that um, and, and and kind of use it for my own kind of, you know, in my own practice because that's that is actually tolerability is far more it, it, it means much more than toxicity, doesn't it? Yeah, and you know, if you think about even coming into 2024, when they said, you know, when I would be asked what are the side effects, I would quote toxicity rates. Mm. But really, what people want to know, I think, is how will I be able to work? Will I be able yeah. to function? Will I That's be able right. to, you know, will I be able to be myself? And really they're saying, is this tolerable or not? Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's a fascinating turnaround on how mm-hmm. we need to talk to each other. Yeah. No, that's, that's a, that's a really good point. Well, thank you for that. Um, so, you know, we know that we can't, people can't compare their breast cancer to somebody else's breast cancer because you know, breast cancer treatment is very tailored specific to that particular person's cancer. So why would somebody get chemotherapy and why would somebody mm-hmm. not get chemotherapy? What, what you know? Right. 
You know, uh, you know, it it really will depend. Like you were saying, breast cancers, you know, are now recognized as very variable you know we have four distinct subtypes right there's a hormone positive or two new negative subtype there's a triple negative where it doesn't express er estrogen receptor or progesterone receptor her two new there's a her two positive subtype and then there's a triple positive subtype where it's hormones and her two positive and really what we're talking about when we when we, we go through this litany of the four types is we're, we're looking for targets that are we can take advantage of. Mm-hmm. And estrogen receptor, HER2 new protein, uh, there are treatments that will uh, are effective in those. They, so the presence of these proteins predict what is available to us. And if you just look at the hormone positive breast cancer, which is most common, most common in older women for sure, we're realizing that chemotherapy may or may not play that big of a role, Mm -hmm. even in younger women, where now not only is chemotherapy on the table, but these new novel targeted treatments and also suppressing or, or preventing the ovaries from functioning for a while. All of these things play into the armamentarium these days. So when you ask about who who will I steer towards chemotherapy, there are still classical factors that make us worry. You know, a very large tumor, um, multiple uh, uh, metastases in the lymph nodes, um, uh, triple negative breast cancer, mainly because uh, there is no hormone receptors that will predict I can use an oral anti-hormone treatment. And then, you know, for a large part, the presence of that HER2 growth factor uh, also predicts who's going to get at least a biologic treatment with chemotherapy most of the times. Great. So, yes, as you said, it kind of depends on the makeup of 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 that cancer, whether they're right. hormone sensitive or you know or not, uh, and whether right. they yep. express the HER2 new um, receptors. So, I guess for example, if somebody with who has triple negative, we can't afford them. You know, we can't give them the anti hormone tablets because right. it's not going to work, and therefore chemotherapy is it's really know, their only option. The only you know? option, yeah, yeah, and you know, even if you look at size criteria, even the size by which we'll recommend systemic chemotherapy for triple negative breast cancers, we'll be, we, we often will recommend chemotherapy for a smaller triple negative breast cancer than we would say for something that express hormone receptors. Right. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting. So, you know, there's been a lot of actually advances in chemotherapy, you know, especially the targeted yeah. therapies, um, you know, the CDK4 inhib- mm-hmm. and six inhibitors, um, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Because I think a lot of people are, you know, are receiving, you know, such drugs like, you know, robocyclib, pulbocyclib, yeah. abemocyclib. So, yeah. No, absolutely. It's, you know, there's in, in all of the um, major uh, types of breast cancers that we talked about, there have been advances. Um, and it seems, fortunately, that it, it's, it's really, um, it has picked up speed about how many more options have become available. Now, if you look at, say, hormone positive breast cancers, you, um, moving very quickly into the sort of post operative context for what would be determined to be, say, quote, a high risk breast cancer. So, this would be someone in whom you would remove a breast tumor, hormone positive, but maybe multiple lymph nodes involved, maybe larger than we suspected. Um, or other features like, a, you know, uh, something that says this tumor is growing rapidly, even if it's hormone positive, we're now reaching for these drugs you mentioned, which are CDK4-6 inhibitors. Mm. And that can be after chemotherapy or after primary treatments or whatever the type was, even if it was radiation only. But for someone who has a high-risk breast cancer, we will be giving chemotherapy. Mm. And then after that, we talk about um, sort of a maintenance or extended adjuvant treatment where we will give them anti-hormone treat therapies in the form of either a drug class called aromatase inhibitors or the classical drug tamoxifen, which is a right. selective estrogen receptor modulator. Now we have data 
that had established the role of these uh, this drug class called CDK4-6 inhibitors in uh, people living with metastatic disease. But now there's data that using them earlier in a select group of people confers a survival advantage. And specifically, that's with two of the drugs in that class, abemocyclob as well as ribocyclob. So more often, you're going to see those coming up now into the post-surgery um, curative intent um, stage of treatments. But beyond that, you know, there are, there are now uh, multiple new HER2 directed drugs. Um, the one that made a big splash last year was trastuzumab directs Tegan mm -hmm. for triple negative breast cancers. We now have indications that immunotherapy is a very effective treatment when given um, after surgery, again, in people deemed to be at high risk. And then for younger people with particularly hormone positive breast cancers, you know, the, um, the Oxford analysis on the use of ovarian function suppression was just presented showing that, or that that alone confers a survival advantage versus not doing ovarian function suppression. Right. So, uh, you know, the, the, Treatment of breast cancer has become very complicated, yes. but I think in that complication comes benefits for the person who has to hear that diagnosis because we're no longer reading from a script saying there's mm. one way to treat this and this is your option. If you don't want it, have a nice life. It actually requires, you know, the person who has been diagnosed and those of us who are still treating it to sit down, review the menu. Mm. and then come up with a choice that is really guided by goals and preferences. And it's really nice to be able to say that for someone who has just heard they have breast cancer. Yeah, it's an exciting time. You know, I know you've just come back from ASCO and, you know, quite yeah. a few of those results that you've just mentioned, you know, relatively new and were talked about. But I think you're you know, the, the plethora of drugs that that's becoming available is it is really exciting. It is, it is. And, you know, this is just in the sort of curative intent. I mean, the treatments for people living with incurable breast cancer or metastatic disease, um, even in that realm, we have options, you know, whether or not, um, you know, trastuzumab directs which was initially used for people with HER2 positive breast cancers, but appears to have activity even if you don't overexpress that protein. Right. Okay. Um, you know, there is an antibody drug conjugate in sasituzumab, govitekin. I mean, the, the list does go on, which is very, very um, um, encouraging. Yeah.